The acoustic camera has three main parts. An array of 96 digital microphones to receive audio data, an FPGA to capture and forward the data, and an Ethernet transceiver to send the data to a computer. The entire device was assembled by hand, including all 96 tiny microphones. The second stage of the hardware is something called an FPGA, which takes the input from the microphones and, through the Mac, turns it into something that a computer can understand. An FPGA is used because it can keep up with all 100 microphones at once, a task that a computer would struggle with. Now, actually using an FPGA is very complicated, but the basic idea is something you've probably already come up with on your own. So, we use an analogy of homework here. So the way you're meant to do homework, if you have, say, five problems in your homework, and each of them takes an hour, you're supposed to go through question one, question two, three, four, five. Uh, we're ignoring, of course, the step about halfway through of realizing you have no idea what you're doing, giving up all hope and crying, uh, just for simplicity here. But this is how you're supposed to do it. Uh, and if you're a teacher watching, this is exactly what everyone does. Uh, just, you know, you can just leave the video right now. Uh, it's fine. This, this is definitely what we all do. In reality, though, what everybody does is you get a couple of friends, and each of you takes one problem, and then you just combine all your answers at the end. And you'll notice that instead of taking five hours now, this takes only one hour, and every problem gets addressed at the same time. The FPGA used here does much the same thing with microphones. Each little component of the FPGA handles a single microphone, and then they just smush all the data together at the end. So once we've got our microphone data, we need to actually send it to the computer. We do this using two things, a Mac and a Phi, in a process that is somewhat analogous to sending a letter, if anyone still actually does that. So the Mac basically adds the address, the to and the from, to our data, and then the Phi essentially puts it in an envelope and actually sends it. As far as these kind of things go, the internals of our FPGA is relatively simple. We start off with the 25 megahertz clock and the data from our microphones. So the first thing we do is we take a PLL to boost our 25 megahertz clock up to 125 megahertz, which will be used later in the Mac, and then divide it by 125 to get a 1 megahertz clock for our microphones. This is sent to each of the microphones for, as the clock for PDM, and each of the microphones outputs a PDM signal. Each pair of microphones outputs a DDR signal, a double data rate signal, alternating between the right and left microphone data outputs. These outputs then come into the FPGA, and we use a rising and falling edge detector on the one megahertz clock, as well as a small delay, combined with 96 registers, one for each microphone, which alternatively trigger on the positive and negative edges, to get 90, all 96 microphone data outputs on 96 separate uh, outputs from the registers. These then clock into a FIFO, which, when it has at least 200 readings, begins sending a packet to the computer. This triggers the Mac to, to start sending the header, which is just stat, uh, static IP and Ethernet header. Then it clocks out all 96 by 200 uh, bytes of microphone data, then it puts out a CRC. This goes to the I.O. section, which is composed of six DDRIO modules, since RGMII is a DDR signal. The uh, data outputs just output the upper or lower nibbles of this output byte, depending on what the phase of the clock is. The enable just puts out whether or not the Mac is currently sending a packet, and the clock actually puts out a uh, 125 megahertz signal, but 90 degrees out of phase with the original clock. This gives us a little bit of delay so that these signals have two nanoseconds to stabilize before they're clocked into the phi. The final step of the process is something called beamforming, which is how the computer takes the data from the microphones and figures out where the sounds came from. 
This relies on the way that sound moves through air. So if we imagine we've got a speaker here, then sound that comes out of it is going to move outward in a sphere. So we can start drawing the waves as they come out of this speaker. We can see that they hit the first microphone in the array here. Now we've got a graph here of time versus when the sound wave hits each element in the array. So we hit this one first, so we'll draw our first dot there. Then we'll keep moving this sound wave forward. We can see it hits this element next. So we draw another point there. Then it hits this element, then this one, then this one. So we draw our points on the graph there. Now, this is the data that comes into the computer. It doesn't know anything about this speaker or how these waves moved. It just knows when each of these microphones saw the sound. So our challenge is to figure out from this where the speaker was. And the way we do that is basically just to draw a line through all our points and then draw another line at a right angle to that line. And that is where our speaker was. So we filled in this graph based on two sound sources coming from different directions. And it's a whole lot less intuitive what's going on here now. So we're going to add a few rules and try to figure it out. So for one, we've added that if two black dots fell on the same position, then they add up and we get a big dot, which is worth plus two. Uh, and it's similar with red dot, those are worth minus two. And now when we draw our lines, we're going to add a few rules. We're going to add up how many dots fall on a line to get a score for that direction. And we'll add up these dots based on these rules. So intersections between dissimilar colors are worth a negative number. Intersections between like colors are worth a positive number. And big dots are worth plus or minus two. So we'll create a few lines that are each spaced half a wavelength apart and alternating between red and black. We then take these lines and overlay them on our chart and add up to get a score for each direction. And that score is how sure we are that there's something in that direction. So if we start out overlaying like we did earlier on a diagonal like this, you can see that where we are evaluating this direction, we're figuring out how likely we think it is that there's something in this direction. So let's add up these lines. We start with this line, doesn't intersect anything, so it's worth zero. This line intersects a big red dot and a small red dot, and it's a red line or in two small red dots. So we add up those values. So it's two plus one plus one. This has a value of four, and we continue adding. So we've got our black line here that intersects a couple of black dots. So each of these is gonna be positive. So this is, we've already got four, so plus two, we've got six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And then again, we're back to red lines and red dots. So that's 11, 12, 13, 14. So this direction has a value of 14. So we can draw that in on this direction. We can now take this and rotate it just a little bit and start adding up in a different direction. So here you can see we've started to get intersections between different colors. We've got a red dot on a black line. So we look up here, that's worth minus one. So this is worth minus one. This is worth plus one. This is worth plus one. This is worth minus one. So we are at uh, minus two and then we've got a red dot intersecting red line, so we've got plus two. So this direction has a total score of zero. We can then continue doing this for a couple of different directions. I won't bore you by going through that, but the values we get out are 16, one, and two. So this informs our output image now. 14 is a fairly high number, so we're pretty sure that there's something in that direction. So we color in this pixel pretty bright. Now the next, the next direction down is zero. That's pretty low. So we color in that pixel very dark. 16, very high, bright. One, low, dark. And two is also low, so that's dark. So we've now built up, admittedly a low resolution, but still an image 
of where we think the sound is coming from. We think it's coming from these two directions, and in fact, that's exactly where it came from to generate this graph. There may have been a few questions that came up in how we showed beamforming previously. And to address those, we have to dive in to how the code actually works at a deeper level. So the first thing that we do is we take the data from each microphone and immediately multiply it by both a sine wave and a cosine wave at the frequency that we're looking at. And this has the effect of filtering it and giving us the phase and magnitude of that frequency in that microphone. So we take our data signal represented as plus and minus one instead of one and zero, and then multiply it by this by each wave individually, and then sum up each of those values across the entire wave. Then we take the, sine, the sum from the sine wave and treat that as the imaginary component of a complex number. And we sum up the cosine wave in the same way and treat that as the real component of this complex number. So what we end up with now, after we do this on every microphone, is an array of phases and magnitudes for each microphone. So to then generate our actual image, we first look at the resolution of our image and the field of view of our image to figure out for each pixel, what angle of arrival do we expect the sound to come from? So in this case, a pixel, say here in the image, might correspond to 20 degrees in X, so 20 degrees off center in X, and zero degrees in Y. A pixel up here would correspond to say 20 degrees in X and 10 degrees in Y. So once we've got these two angles, we go and compute, based on our array geometry, how we expect the signal to move across the array. So in this case, the blue is the wave front, like we showed earlier, how it propagates around, how it propagates across the array. And our green lines are, are the distance that that wave front has to travel between hitting an individual microphone, one of these black dots, and hitting the center of the array. Now the center of the array is chosen arbitrarily as R0, that could be anywhere, but we use, we use the center of the array because it's easier. So we want to compute the length of those green lines because that's going to tell us how far the wave had to travel, which is going to tell us how long it takes the wave to get from a microphone to the center of the array. So that's simply the sine of this angle times the distance between the center of the array and that element. Now we do this for both x and y and then just add up those two distances, then divide it by the speed of sound and multiply it by the frequency, and we get out a phase for that microphone that we would expect for that angle of arrival. So if we imagine we had only a single sound source at exactly this point, then this is what this array would look like. So we then invert this array, we just take the negative uh, of the phase for each of these elements, and then for every, and we generate a, a set of these arrays for every single pixel in our output image. So, and we do, we do these, this computation at the very beginning of the program because these uh, tables don't change. So once we want to generate our image, we look at a specific pixel, we find its a table of phases that we would expect if our source is actually coming from that direction, and we then multiply this set of complex numbers by our actual microphone data. And since this is what we would expect and this is what we actually got, if the two line up, then that would then since complex numbers when added together add their phases together, that should align the phases of every microphone uh, in the array. So once we do that, we just add up all the microphones together, and if there's a strong signal in that direction, we'll get a very large, complex number. If they don't line up, then they'll move around in different directions, and they'll cancel out, and we'll get a small number. So we simply take the magnitude of the sum of the product of our microphone data times the lookup table for that position in the image. We sum those up, we take the magnitude of that vector, and that is the value for that pixel 
in the image. We repeat this for every pixel in our image, and that gives us our final image.